Okay, so now we know essentially how many electrons can fit in each orbital category, S, P, D, F. All right. Um, now, to organize ourselves, it's, it's easiest to remember these facts um, rather than just memorizing a whole bunch of configurations. We want to use the periodic table to help us out because it's a lot of things to remember. Um, so there's this nice diagram that outlines the energy level, that's the number, one, two, three, etc., with the orbital shape, the sublevel. So S, P, D, and F are shown here. So the yellow ones we call the S block. The, the green ones are the P blocks. I already showed you those before. The D block is light blue and the F block is the dark blue ones. Now here's what's interesting. We just said uh, a moment ago that the S, oh my gosh, where's my cursor? The S block contains two electrons. The P block contained six electrons. The D block had 10 and the, and the F block for each energy level can fit 14 electrons. Now here's how that is related on the periodic table. So the S block here is gonna be hydrogen and helium. There's two boxes, all right? So energy level one in the S block, you got one, two. So effectively hydrogen has one electron. Let me change that ink color, it's a little hard to see. So hydrogen has one electron, helium has two. Sometimes we draw our electrons as arrows, so I'm going to draw that here. In the 2s, we're one more energy level from where hydrogen started. So here we have lithium. That's going to have one electron in the 2s. The one next to lithium, so beryllium, has two electrons, one in the 2s and another one in the 2s. If we keep going, each box represents kind of adding one more electron to the pile. So Aluminum has three electrons, two of them in the 2s and one of them in the 2p. The next element would have two of them in the 2p, which we draw pointing up. We'll get to why that is in a second. And three of them and on and on and on like that, okay? So each box in a period, in a block represents like one electron. So we can kind of just count the boxes. like. I can remember how many electrons fit into the 3D energy level by just counting them. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's our ten electrons. There's 14 in the, across the F. Okay, so we need to remember using the periodic table that you have because that's what you get on a test. You're not going to get this one. All right, we need to remember this is the S block where the period matches the energy level. This is the P block, where the period matches the energy level for that. The D block is one less, the energy level is one less than the period. So like the 3D energy level happens in the fourth period, okay? So those transition metals are all the 3D elements. Finally, we have the, the F block, which has 14 in it. 4F belongs in the sixth period. So the F block is like minus two from the period to figure out the energy level. Okay, so let's practice it, all right, let's use it. What is the max number of electrons that can fit in a 5D orbital? Okay, well, a 5D orbital is this right here, right there, so 5D. Um, we just counted the D in the 3D and it's gonna have the same number of boxes because the, the groups line up. So we're gonna go with the fact that there are 10 electrons that you can fit into a 5D orbital. Now this question is asking us, what is the maximum number of electrons that can be occupied in a th n equals three sublevel? So that means anywhere where we see the number three. So here's two of those. Here's a number three in the 3D. So we're gonna have to add up those 10. So we've so far we've got two plus the 10 from the 3D. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six from 3P. So that's gonna be six. So all together, we just add up all of these things, we can fit 18 electrons in the n equals three level. So we'd pick D. Okay. So we have to have a condensed way of writing these relationships down, okay? Because remember, as we go through the periodic table, all of the elements 
farther down contain every electron energy level that the previous ones had. So it's kind of like it's kind of like a game, like a board game. You have to go through the entire periodic table. So if I made you write configurations for everything, it would be really, really time consuming. So we need a shorthand way to do it. Okay, so we show the energy level as a number, the block as a letter, S, P, D, or F. So these can be S, P, D, or F. And then we use an, a superscript number here to communicate that four electrons happen to be in that energy level. Okay. Each shape can contain two electrons. So our p orbital has three shapes. So that contained three times two electrons, which is six. So this is an acceptable number of electrons to have. Okay. The 3p4 orbital, so this 3p4 notation, would be the outer electrons for the third period. So here's the third period. And four electrons into the p block. So here we got one, two, three, four. So that element would be sulfur. The complete configuration for sulfur would look something like this. We start all the way at the beginning, where it's 1s. We have to go through hydrogen and helium, so that's two electrons. And we jump down to lithium here, 2s, and there's two boxes in that category. So we write two electrons. And we jump across, we go 2p, we're still in the second period here, so it's 2p, and we go all the way across. So one, two, three, four, six electrons there. We drop down into the third energy level. Now we're in 3s, and we cross all the way, you know, Na and Mg. And then we get to the 3p level, and that's our final uh, electron count, and you have four. So this is the complete electron configuration for sulfur. But I knew it was sulfur because the valence electrons, the outer electrons, ended up being at 3p4. So hydrogen is a really easy one. It's 1s1. It's the lowest energy level. It only has one electron. Oxygen, we start back at hydrogen, so we have that in there. But there's two because we go all the way from hydrogen to helium. And we go down here at 2s, and there's two boxes. So I put two electrons. And then I go one, two, three, four. We call that the 2p category, and there's four of them. So it has kind of a similar electron count on the outside to what sulfur has, two in the S and four in the P, two in the S, four in the P. That's because they're in the same group, okay? So we did sulfur already over there. Iron is located right here. So this is one where uh, if you're using your regular periodic table, it gets a bit tricky because you're not gonna have the, this guideline with you on your, on your final exam. So we gotta get used to thinking about this without you know, these little prompts like 3D written right on there. We start in the beginning again, so it goes 1s2 right here. We go through hydrogen and helium, and then 2s2, and then 2p6, and then 3s2. We go all the way across the p again, so that's going to be another 6. Now we're, we're down into the right period. This is period 4, so 4, I'm going to come down here to write the rest. 4s is full. And then I have to count one, two, three, four, five, six to get to iron. That one is a minus one from the period. So it's 3D and we just said six electrons are in it. So that's a complete configuration for iron. I want you to pick two elements. I don't know why the P ended up funny. And write the configuration here for those. So pause the video, take a second and do that. I'm going to grade it when you turn it in. Do the same thing, electron configuration for two different elements on the periodic table. Okay, now here's some more. I want you to do this um, on a separate piece of paper, so we're going to compare when you get into class. Okay, so you're going to do this now, and we're going to switch papers in class and see if everybody gets the same answers or not. Uh, I want you to do the same exercise we just did for nitrogen and the same thing for chromium. And then figure out what element is represented by number three and count the number of 3D electrons in nickel. Okay, so that's a good homework assignment. Now, I used the word valence electrons a second ago.
Those are the electrons that are on the very outside of an atom, and the reason we care more about those than any other is they are the ones that react with things. Okay, the core electrons, those are the ones on the inside, don't react. They're stable, they stay where they are. All right, so the way it works is everything after the nearest noble gas before your element is going to be um, a valence electron. So for example, if we write the electron configuration for chlorine, okay, um, go ahead and grab your green periodic table, that's what I'm looking at. We start off with the full configuration, so 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, um, 3s2, 3p5, because chlorine's in the third period, So, and then I have to count in the p block, and there's five spots. So rather than writing this entire thing, it turns out, since the valence electrons are the only ones that react, we can use the shorthand if the question doesn't specifically say complete electron configuration. So the shorthand, we look for chlorine on the periodic table, it's at element number 17. And we go backwards up the periodic table, going backwards in atomic number, until we get to the nearest noble gas, which is group 18. So the nearest noble gas before chlorine turns out to be neon. So we write that in brackets. Now these brackets mean that all the electrons that neon has are inside of uh, whatever chemical chlorine in this case. And then I just have to write the ones after that. Right? So neon is all the stuff. That's what neon means. So in the shorthand method, we, we're just summarizing all the core electrons and we only write the valence electrons. This makes it a lot easier to count the total outer electrons. There's seven for chlorine. Okay, um, so that's how you can do that. It's a handy way if you're allowed to use uh, shorthand. If it doesn't tell you to do a complete configuration, you can use shorthand. All right, so the next way we're going to use is to draw kind of a little diagram. So hydrogen has only the 1s or energy level. And so it's only got one electron because it's the simplest element. And so I can point that electron up or I could point it down in, in my box. Either way is fine. The electron has no preference. If there's no other electrons in there, it doesn't matter. On the other hand, if I have two electrons, they have to be opposite. It's like shoes. You can't fit two shoes in a shoe box if they're pointing the same way. So we got to point one up, one down. That's what helium looks like. Lithium has that core electrons, but it also has one more in the 2s energy level. Again, this one could be drawn up or down. It doesn't matter. We can't point them in the same direction because electrons pointing in the same direction are repulsing. They repel each other. They're repulsive. <laughs> We call this the Pauli exclusion principle. It says that for every box we have, you have to point electrons in opposite sides. Okay, so let's draw hydrogen. Here's a similar representation, right? We start at the lowest energy on the bottom. These are, these are called Aufbau, which is kind of German for fill up. So we're filling up from the bottom, just like a glass of milk. Hydrogen has one electron, so I'm only gonna put one, one electron in here, but I could point it up or I could point it down. It doesn't matter which one you choose. The configuration for carbon um, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p, whoops, not 2p4, 2p2. So I'm going to draw the same thing. So we got 1s with two electrons, so one pointing up and one pointing down, 2s also with two, and the 2p. Now, Here's where our next rule comes into play. You'll notice that I chose to draw my electrons in two different boxes. They point the same way. The reason for that is something called Hund's rule. Okay, and here's kind of how it works. If you imagine that you have a house and you have, say, four bedroom house, and you have one child. You could put that child in any room and they could be, you know, their bed could face whatever direction they want to. That's fine. If you have two children, you're gonna put them in two separate rooms. You're not gonna keep them together. Electrons are like children. They fight. They don't wanna be close together. So we're gonna keep them in their own room. However, it turns out electrons affect each other even when they're in different rooms. It turns out they wanna point in the same direction, okay? 
So again, this is the rule we call Hun's rule. Okay, it says everything's gonna line up and spread out as much as it can. So if I had three electrons, I would still point it up and it would be in the third box. Okay. Um, I could have picked any one of these boxes. So it's equally valid to do something like this where they point down and it's in the first and third box. It doesn't matter because these are all the same energy. So there's no particular reason to choose one box over another. All right, so we're gonna keep going. Nitrogen goes 1s2, 2s2, and then it's three electrons into the p orbital. So I'm gonna draw three of them all pointing the same way. They could go down, they could go up, I don't care. Oxygen is the same thing except it's got one more electron. Now I have to pick where to put this electron and it has to go opposite of the one that you know is already there. You could put it in the first box or the second box or the third, it doesn't matter. Okay, so these two rules are what govern how we fill in these diagrams and, and like how electrons are organized. All right, so we saw last week in lab what happens when um, you know, lithium and sodium get put into water. I want you to watch this old video. It's from the same guy who does um, that car show. Well, they used to. I think it's done for now. But anyway, you'll recognize the guy who's who's kind of hosting it. But what you'll do is go into the Google, turn this on in presentation mode, and then you can click on the picture here. Okay, I want you to watch this video. I'm going to ask you a question. Um, what did all these reactions have in common? Okay, so go watch that video, check it out. It's pretty entertaining, actually, it's pretty short. Um, they blow stuff up, so you should watch it. All right, um, the, the chemicals that they actually react here have a couple things in common. One of them is that re they react the same. The question though is why do they all behave the same? So if you do an electron configuration of lithium with a shorthand, it's gonna be, um, let's see, helium is the noble gas before it. And so then it's 2s1. Um, the next one is sodium. Its nearest noble gas is neon. So it's gonna be 3s1. After that, we have potassium, which is gonna have argon for its core and 4s1. So you see the pattern, it's a noble gas core with one valence electron. That one electron is very, very vulnerable. It has nobody to protect it, nobody to, to sort of shield it from reacting. So they all react really, really quickly, especially with water. All right, so When we have the shorthand notation, it's a really great way of communicating the most important electrons. Those are the ones that are reacting. So when sodium reacts, it's going to give up this electron. This electron has the highest energy because it's the three energy level. And it's going to give that one up first. Okay. So we can fill in some shorthand electron configuration. I will do mm, I will do sulfur here. We we had the full electron configuration a second ago. So that's um, on this slide here, uh, right here. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, like that. I find sulfur on my periodic table, and so it's in group three, period 16. Sorry, that was backwards. Group 16, period three. And I move back up the periodic table to find the noble gas before it. That's going to be Ne. So from Ne, then I just go 3s2. These are just the outside electrons. And 3p, 1, 2, 3, 4. I have 4p electrons, so 3p4. So my number of valence electrons is just 2 plus 4, so 6. So finish that for calcium strontium. And then here, I want you to tell me what this element is and how many valence electrons it has. So fill this in. Okay, so to review what we already know from earlier in the semester, um, 
metals are on the left side of the periodic table and non-metals are on the right hand side of the periodic table. And then of course you got these metalloids which are a weird mixture in the middle. It turns out that the farther left you go, the more metallic you are. So the most metallic element is our buddy Francium over here. The least metallic, which is also the same as saying the most non-metallic, is going to be helium. So the higher up and to the right you go, the more non-metallic character you have. Meaning things like not conductive, really brittle, all these different characteristics that we have for the non-metals. Okay, so if I want to compare two elements, I can determine which one is more metallic or less metallic. So for example, gold and silver, which is underneath here. Let me move that. No, I'm still there. <laughs> gold and silver are both metals, but in determining which one is more conductive or which one is more metallic, um, I go with the one that is farther down or farther to the left. In this case, they're in the same column, so we're going to go with gold is more metallic than silver is. Okay, so you can compare the farther down into the, whoops, the farther down into the left, the more metallic something is. The farther up into the right, the more non-metallic it is. So that's one trend that we learned about in this chapter. It's not really chapter 11. It used to be. The next trend is about atomic radius. So I want you to define this um, here, but you can use this picture to help you. This is the nucleus of an atom. A radius is the distance between the center of a circle and the edge. We use the symbol little r for radius. Okay. Um, ionization energy you defined in the pre-lab last week, so you can you can pull that back up and write it down here. Electron affinity is kind of related, so ionization energy is about taking electrons. So electron affinity is how much does an element like electrons? If you really like to steal electrons, you have high affinity, high affinity. Affinity is another way of saying, do I like something? I have an affinity for reading. It means I like to do it. Okay, so if you really like electrons, you have a high affinity. Um, it's related to this idea of electronegativity. Electronegativity is all about how much a particular atom pulls on electrons, okay? So here's a picture that shows you atomic radius. Um, like if we look down this group, we can see that adding more electrons, we're adding energy levels, each group we go down. So here's group two, group three, group four. As we go down, we're adding an energy level, which means it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we go down each period. Um, so as we go down the period, we're adding energy, which means it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, as we go across, so from the left to the right, if we're just looking at period two, the lithium is much bigger than the neon is. So you can think of it, the big ones are on the left and the small ones are on the right. So if I wanted to draw an arrow showing where it's going from little to big, it would go this way. So the farther down we go and the farther to the left we go, the larger the um, element is going to be. Okay, so that's because of something, the, the relationship going across the period is due to something we call effective nuclear charge. Okay, so basically um, if I have one proton, one electron, like hydrogen, if the electron is close to the nucleus, it feels a strong pull. If it's farther away from the nucleus, it's a comparatively weak uh, pull. It still wants to hang out there, it's just not as attracted to the nucleus because it's farther away. So electrostatic attraction, that is positive and negative, depends on distance. Now, on the other hand, if I had a lot of electrons, it means I have a lot of protons in here. So um, we have a lot of positive charge in this nucleus. Let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five. We have six electrons, so I have six protons in the center of this atom. That means that, that we have six really dense positive charges here in the middle. These electrons are going to be pulled closer in 
So you can imagine like these electrons are all pulled in closer to the nucleus because six positive charges pulls a lot harder than six or sorry than one positive charge would. So when we have more electrons, we also need to remember we have more protons and they pull on it. So as we go across the period here, looking at this, we start off with uh, just three protons for lithium and neon ends up with 10. So that's 10 positive charges pulling on those electrons. That's why the radius shrinks. You have more protons tugging them down. So that, that means the atom gets smaller. All right. So. Now we have, so here's our metallic character trend. I don't know why there was a bar there. That's weird. The farther left and down we go, the more metallic. You can also draw that, you know, going like this. So that means more metallic. The next one is atomic radius. We said that the atomic radius gets bigger as you go down and towards the left. So it's kind of the same trend for metallic character. So francium is the biggest element on the periodic table, and it's also the most metal, <laughs> most metallic. Helium is the smallest element in the periodic table on the opposite corner, and it's like the least metallic or the most non-metallic, however you want to look at that. Okay, so the next trend is ionization energy, and we kind of looked at this in the lab. You graphed it a little bit, but here's the idea. Ionization energy is however much energy is required to steal an electron from an element. Okay, so sodium gives up electrons really easy. That means it has a low ionization energy. Chlorine does not give up electrons easily. It likes to take them from other places. So this means it has a high ionization energy. If we compare sodium and chlorine on the periodic table, we see that sodium is far left and chlorine is on the far right. So your trend on the periodic table is going to match that, right? So the farther left we go, the lower. So this is low ionization energy and this is high. So you might want to draw our arrow the other way, actually. It's going from low to high, okay? There's also a trend going vertically, so we're going to look at that. And that one's pretty easy to understand. So let's compare, say, sodium, which has a size something, you know, I'm just making this up, but for, for reference, it could be something like that. Compared to francium, which is huge, really, really big. We have seven energy levels there. So the question to ask yourself is, would it be easier to pull an electron from the sodium, which is small, or from the francium, which is big? Your nucleus is in the center in both cases, right? So the amount of force that the electron feels from the outside to the inside is much higher when you're close to it. So the electron for sodium is closer to the nucleus, which is the same thing as saying it's closer to, oh, wow, I don't know what just happened, nucleus. It's closer to the positive charges. In francium, the electrons were really, really far. That radius is huge. So that means the electron on the outside does not feel as much of a pull. All right, that means it's easier to steal the electron. So going up and down, it starts low at the top. Or I'm sorry, that's backwards. It starts low at the bottom. It's really easy to steal an electron from francium, and it gets high on the top. So essentially, as we move up and to the right, it's harder and harder and harder to take an electron, meaning ionization energy is higher. You should have seen this on your trend when you graphed it in the lab. All right, so period one is hydrogen and helium. Period two is lithium, beryllium, boron, so on and on. This, this trace here is period two. Here's three, here's four. Four gets a little fuzzy because we have all those transition metals in it, so it's not as obvious. But generally, across the period, across the period, ionization energy increases. Okay, so this graph shows us that. So I want you to test yourself before I advance this slide identify what the, be able to fill this in, draw it in, what the metallic character trend is, what the um, atomic radius trend is, and finally, so far, the ionization energy. Okay, pause the video and do that. All right, so metallic trend goes down into the left for increasing metallic character. That means francium is the most and helium is the least. Francium is also the largest atom, so atomic radius points down and to the left again. 
And francium, if it's the most metallic character and the largest, that means it gives up its electrons easiest. So ionization is low on francium side, high on helium side. Just remember, helium never gives up an electron, ever, ever. It keeps them forever, okay? So now when we make ions, we need to understand what's happening. When you, when you take lithium and it gives up an electron, that doesn't take very much energy because lithium likes to give them away. So it's a very low ionization energy. Giving away an electron makes an element shrink when you become an ion, positive ions, which again, we named those cations because they're positive. So when you make a cation, you have lost an electron. So bye-bye electron and you get a positive charge. That means that your atomic radius is larger than your ionic radius. So our ionic radius is 0.9 and the atomic is 1.28. The same trend happens no matter whether, you know, uh, even if the atom is bigger. So sodium, we kick out an electron to make it Na+, it goes from 1.66 to 1.16, so it's still decreasing. Every time you make something into an ion, it decreases the size if the ion is positively charged. Magnesium gives up two electrons, and so it's going to shrink twice. So it's pretty small. Mg2 plus is pretty small. Aluminum gives up three electrons, because that's how you get the three plus. You have three more protons than electrons. So we get a very small, almost half the size when we do that. Now, over here in, in group 16, this is 16 on our periodic table, and this one's 17. We notice that they have a tendency to not give up electrons. They become negative. That means that we add electrons here. So if you're adding electrons, that means your charge is negative. I have two electrons extra, right? So we can remember that um, protons minus the number of electrons will give you the charge. Okay, so here you can find that sulfur has 16 electrons. Um, it absorbed two more, so it has 18 total electrons, so our charge is minus two, okay? When you absorb electrons, that means you have to get bigger. It inflated, okay? So we see that trend happening here. Now, the last trend to talk about is electronegativity. I like this figure better. It's from a different book, but it shows um, relative heights for increasing electronegativity. And what we see is if we go from cesium on the left corner all the way up to fluorine on the upper right fluorine has the highest electronegativity and cesium is really low so our trend goes that way okay all right so the trend in electronegativity kind of kind of goes in the same general direction as ionization energy does then which kind of makes sense. If it's really hard to remove an electron, that means that you really like electrons, okay? And so electronegativity and ionization energy are kind of defined opposite, but they are gonna follow the same pattern. All right, so like, for example, does chlorine like sodium, like electrons more or less than sodium? So chlorine has an electronegativity value of three, sodium is 0.9. That means that chlorine really likes electrons. It's not going to um, give up its own electrons very easily. Okay, so this helps us to predict what kinds of bonds can form when things are going to connect in the next chapter. Um, we're going to go into details about this the beginning in class this week, and we'll deepen that understanding as we get into the next chapter. Okay, so I'll, I'll pick up these lecture notes at the end of the week. Uh, make sure you filled in all the places where I told you I was going to grade it. There's quite a few in this section, so be sure to go back and do that.